Good evening, BSKL Year 13s, for webinar number two for paper six. I've got a couple of people already on the chat. Hi, Rachel. Hi, Olivia. Thanks so much for coming. Glad you could make it. Really pleased. <clears throat> so this evening, we're going to be going through the paper six mock that you guys sat about a week and a half ago. And I'll do my best to go through it and clarify any of the bits that you guys found difficult and talk you through all the questions on the paper. Um, the webinar starts in two minutes. I'll give it one more minute. I'll uh, let you guys just wait for a moment more. <clears throat> I hope that the paper four five review was useful. It was nice to get some feedback off you guys. I got a feedback off Anan. He said that the multiple choice run through was really useful. I'll try and do some more of those over the coming weeks. Uh, maybe set you guys some work on some multiple choice questions that will be focused on unit four and five. And I'll go through them on some webinars. I think that might be really useful for people. So being able to look back is always useful, having things that are recorded. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to kick off. I may as well start straight away. Okay, so I'm going to do my usual share screen. I have, of course, as you guys all know, having watched all the previous ones, I've done the usual thing. I've taken your unit six paper. Uh, I've filled it out with model answers, comparing with the mark schemes afterwards. So... It's kind of nice for you guys to see this because I've got the mark scheme up on a separate laptop. I've done my own my own answers. And it's nice for me to be able to chat with you guys through it so that you can see why I'm putting the answers that I put. You can see that I've done it in exam conditions so that it makes it absolutely crystal clear as to why I'm doing things, what I would have done. And it also, it's also nice to also show my flaws as well and to be able to highlight to you guys when I've made a mistake and then I've gone back to the mark scheme and gone, okay, let's look at why. Okay, so this is paper six. Now, this is a rather unusual paper six because we put it together by hand. This is, this is um, a, a paper, of course, which is focused on all of the practical elements of the course. And... We, of course, have only done transition metals, equilibrium, and rates, which means this paper is very much focused on those. So question number one, even though labeled as question number two, always entertaining. It says a green crystalline solid, which is nice immediately because it's flagging up our colors, which means I'm hoping that everyone looks at this question and immediately drops into transition metals. Dissolves in water to give a pale green solution. Now, that is important. It's nice for us to be picking up those kind of observations because that immediately flags up iron 2, possibly nickel 2. A couple of observations, but those are the main two greens that we tend to see. When dilute sodium hydroxide is added to a solution group D, a green precipitate is observed which is E. When ammonia solution is added, and of course ammonia in this case, and it says ammonia solution, it doesn't say concentrated. So this is going to be acting as a base in this, this setting. Uh, today we get the same green precipitate. So that confirms the base theory. Uh, and it does not redissolve on excess. Now we know in general the three pluses, uh, okay, wait, what does this start? Wait, what doesn't this start at seven? Doesn't this start at seven? It's seven minutes, it's one minute past seven, David. Come on. I mean, I started on the dot. Okay, I might have started two minutes early. I do, I do apologize, David. Uh, I'm not going to lie. Last night, David, I had, uh, I think, two watches, and both of those started at about 20 past seven. Although I think a Nan was there from the beginning. 
But I do feel like I just, I thought I'd get started because I wasn't sure how many people would turn up. But David, thank you so much for coming along. <laughs> Can I just say, David, your comment on YouTube was outstanding. I'm, at, I'm with you, dude. I think we need to get me up to 8 million. Definitely. That's, that's the aim here. Definitely. Okay, so since David has arrived momentarily late, when you don't rise and grind, the consequences are obvious. Uh, I completely agree. Yeah, I commented too. Yes, thanks, Olivia. You're right, you did. Uh, thank you. Yes. I, I only caught your comment in the last hour before starting this one. Come on, we need to keep streaming, guys. I agree, definitely. Let's go back to the paper. Okay, so... We've already walked through. We had a green crystalline solid, which suggests, of course, ionic. Pale green, which is iron 2, nickel 2. We had sodium hydroxide forming a green precipitate. Oh, crossed it out. Forming a green precipitate. The ammonia being added as a base. There is a solution forming the same green precipitate. Does not redissolve, which confirms definitely not 3+. plus. Identify the formula of substance E. The trap here is just the fact that everyone's going to quote D. Everyone's going to go for the hexaraqua, and it's not. They're looking for the precipitate formed after the sodium hydroxide was added. Hence, the iron tetra aqua dihydroxy complex. I've even gone totally to town on this. Put it in the square brackets, added in my solid state symbol, which is nice. So, nice easy start to the paper. Felt like most people... Do you know what? There will be a couple of people here who are well-read who would say, how do I know it's not the nickel? Nickel is, is, is a transition metal that you, do, you, do, you are meant to know about in at Excel. However, you don't cover nickel's reactions with sodium hydroxide and ammonia. So this is pointing very strongly towards iron 2 rather than nickel 2. Nickel 2 comes up in terms of its square planar complexes. And in this case, they're wanting you to pick out iron too. My quality of streaming is horrendous. I have absolutely no idea how to improve that. Like, I've got none. So what I'm going to do is I'll try and move it as little as possible. Next one. When a solution of D, so this is D, is going to be the hexa aqua. That'll be Fe2 plus hexaraqua ion, 2 plus Aq. And it says, when D is warmed with dilute sulfur, a gas is produced. Now, now, what's interesting, of course, is the green suggests the Fe2, but the dilute, so they, they've done something really clever here. What they've done is they've dropped into one of the tests you learned at AS level. You drew... Um, when you cover, in fact, technically, guys, it's GCSE. You learn that the sodium hydroxide test at GCSE flags up iron 2 plus as a green precipitate, iron 3 plus as a brown precipitate, copper 2 plus as a blue precipitate. And at GCSE, it ends there. Though, of course, others that you then tend to pick up at A level being chromium, cobalt. Uh, aluminium, aluminium, of course, is, is AQA. Um, but here's the clever bit. There is one additional ion that you pick up, and it's complex. It's the ammonium ion. And the test for the ammonium ion is to add sodium hydroxide and warm it, and you will produce a gas. And the gas, of course, is ammonia. And the ammonia, of course, is tested with damp red litmus paper, and it turns blue. So really clever that they've dropped, they've, they've, been, they've been in a transition metal setting and they've all of a sudden gone, right, let's see if you guys remember your, your, your gas, your, your complex ion test from GCSE and AS. That is not A2. What that means is if you are not well revised, guys, on unit one and two from AS and especially unit three, you, they're, they're, you're going to end up falling here. So you've got to know it. Paper six, if you do a lot of these papers, you're going to keep refreshing your memory about those AS chemical tests, so it's worthwhile doing. So identify the formula of the gas F, ammonia making an appearance. 
When a solution of barium chloride is added to the solution D, it's dropped you into another GCSE test. Barium chloride, just to remind us all, folks, that this is the BACL2, but the species responsible for the test is the BA2 plus ion, and that is added to solution D, a white precipitate forms, which is insoluble in hydrochloric acid. Can I just point out that the insoluble in hydrochloric acid is a lovely, lovely addition because barium chloride can be used to test for several ions. The sulfite, sulfate ion is the main culprit, which is what they wanted you to spit out. The white precipitate G, barium sulfate. They've tested for, for SO42 minus. There is another ion that it forms with, and that's the carbonate ion. Now, the carbonate ion is destroyed. That's why when you do the barium chloride test, you, you before doing it, you add hydrochloric acid first, that destroys the carbonate ions, transforming those into carbon dioxide, and it leaves only the sulfate ion, which will form that white precipitate, because the carbonate ions do as well. But in this case, insoluble. When if you add the hydrochloric acid afterwards, it'll redissolve. Really lovely question, that, because it just takes GCSE up to that a ASA2 level, and it's expecting you to be able to read between those lines. It's really lovely. Next. So, as a result, deduce the formula of the three ions present in D. So, in the D solid, if you scroll all the way back, this was the crystalline solid. And they wanted the, the three ions that these tests have picked up. So, we've picked up the iron 2, which was the green. We picked up the sulfate as a result of the Ba2 plus test, the barium chloride. And ammonium, because of the NaOH, warmed, gas red litmus turning blue lovely question like it's great can i just point out that this question for me was incomplete i have seen this done several times and there should have been an e there was an e on the end of this and it's been deleted it's been deleted by edexcel it's been deleted by us i don't know who did it i mean i put this paper together so it's probably me but um it's nice for me to extend this and go the follow-up question for E would have been give, no, sorry, suggest, suggest a formulae, a formulae for D. Given that you've just picked up all three ions, you should theoretically be able to give me the formulae of the ionic crystal at the beginning. And I wanted, I wanted to add this to the webinar because it's got some lovely some lovely niche things here in chemistry, which is number one, it's a, it, the question is always suggest. What that means is you allowed variations on this. They realize that this won't have been taught to you. They're wanting to test your understanding of can you put ions together? Now, when I've listed the three here, listed the iron two, the sulfate and ammonium, I should have done it positive to negative because what I want you to realize is that you can build this. We've got an ammonium one plus ion with an Fe two plus ion. That leads us to a total of three plus. And that is bound to a sulfate ion as SO42 minus. Now at the present, that was, that was the worst uh, ion sack. Uh, no, that's better, two minus. Um, these are not compatible in the ratio that they currently sit in. You couldn't have, lots of students at this point would want to spit out a formula, a formulae that just simply does that. That's what they're gonna want to do. And uh, people are probably even gonna be asking about the question, the, 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 the brackets, but that can't work because if you did that, you'd have a plus two, a plus one, and a two minus. That would give us an overall charge of plus one. This won't be an ionic solid that the lattice wouldn't be stable. So what they're gonna want you to do is to realize that you're gonna want multiple SO4 two minuses, let's go for two of them, to give us a four minus in total. And you're gonna double the ammonium ion. If you double that one, you're gonna get a total of four plus and that cancels. So our final formulae, could, now you can do this in any order, but it's nice, to, I mean, I always say to students that metals should come first. So iron brackets, ammonium, Four brackets two SO4 brackets two. And that what that gives us, that gives us uh, now ammonium. Funnily enough, the ammonium tends to go alphabetical because it's 
it's a positive iron, but it doesn't make much of a difference. Those people who are really picky will be going, oh, the ammonium iron should be coming first. Ammonium iron two sulfate is would be a formula. It's just nice. Now, by the way, they'd allow both of those. That is a that is a correct mark, and that is a correct mark. It's just nice for me to show you that expansion on that question because it comes up on a regular basis, and I need you to see how I'm doing it. I'm looking to create the same number of positives as negatives, and so on. You can see what I've done in my working. So just bear in mind, they 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 often like to do this. Okay, so transition metals are left behind, and we jump jump in straight to rates. And at this point, we come across a rather unusual iodine clock. So I've got propanone. Do you know what? I actually would love to sit down practically and see if I can do this experiment and see if it gives me an iodine clock. I'm almost certain that it won't. What it'll give me is a funny slur. Rather than an instant change blue, it'll give me a funny change. It'll slur into black, but probably relatively quickly. Um, but they're giving me an iodine clock. Now, can I just point out that when I saw this question appear, and I'm... I have year 13s. I have sat this paper as if I'm you. So when I was, when I, when I was doing it, I, I've not had the mark scheme in front of me, and I'm looking at the questions, and I know that people are going to be like, but you've got 12 years of experience. I get it. But what I can do is talk you through my thinking, which will hopefully give you guys a bit more of an inkling as to what I'm doing. So the first thing I'm doing is when I saw this question, I immediately clocked onto iodine. Now, iodine has been appearing for you guys for the last year and a half in group seven. It haunts you group seven, guys. And you need to know your sevens. You need to know your halogens. Fluorine being our pale, pale, pale yellow, in fact, colorless. Chlorine, a green gas, colorless in solution, often seen as pale green in swimming pools. Then we get to bromine, brown liquid, brown gas, and an orange solution, hence bromine, water being orange and iodine being brown in solution, black, grayish, solid, purple gas. So in this case, I, see, I saw iodine and I saw the AQ, and I was like, oh, that's starting off brown. That's a brown solution I'm adding. I'll put even brown AQ. And I'm going to be forming iodide, which of course iodide, all, all group sevens in their ionic states are gonna be colorless. So. I was immediately already thinking in my head, one of these questions is gonna involve an observation. And so it was it was there. Okay, show by calculation the number of moles where the propanone or iodine is in excess. Nice question, dead straightforward. They wanted us to simply extract the data. So it said 50 centimeters cubed of iodine solution concentration. This, right, run it. So I did. And there are those numbers, 0 0.02, number of moles is C times V over 1,000. For those real sticklers to the symbols, MV over 1,000. I prefer C times V. <clears throat> so concentration, 0 0.02. There's that one, 50 centimeters cubed. All over 1,000, I gain my moles. Nice and straightforward. Should have been an easy one mark for you guys in year 13. Next, propanone, right, where's my data? At that point... I'm like, right, propanone, 25 centimeters of propanone solution, concentration two molar, right? So again, run it through. Can I just point out, I was really, really surprised about that. I didn't expect it to be given as a solution. Propanone is most, when you're using like these organic solvents, they tend to be given as, as pure liquids and you'll be given a density. And you'll be, if you ever get given a density, don't freak out about it. They'll give you it in grams per centimeter cubed. And if you've got 25 centimeters, you'll be able to then multiply that by that guy to give you the, the grams. And then you run grams over grams on it. So, but I saw this, I mean, they made it easy for us. This was an easy one. I ran the concentration, ran the volumes, right. And I got the two and I saw, and I immediately said, right. And I wrote this, that there is the mark. I've got 0.05 which is greater than 0.001, propanone is in excess, move on. What would the most suitable piece of apparatus be needed for removing a 10 centimeter cubed sample from the mixture? So of course, as, as a chemist, I'm immediately going graduated with PET. And do you know what was interesting was when I went back to the mark scheme after I'd completed the paper and I was marking it, it said 
pipette. It allowed you to simply state pipette. I would never do that year 13. This is where the mark schemes are often going to be walking you into trouble. Just stick with good chemistry. A graduated pipette, they're, they've just come out of university. They're super intelligent. They are the best pieces of equipment for being able to measure out a really accurate example. A pipette is used for removing several drops. You'd use a pipette with an indicator, but a graduated pipette is removing a specific volume. Do stick with good chemistry. Okay, what would be the most suitable piece of apparatus for measuring 20 centimeters cubed of the sodium hydroxide solution? Now, this one I thought was genius because I was like, hang on, I'm going to spit out a measuring cylinder straight away, but I wanted a bit of clarity as to what it was, and then I found it, which is immediately each sample was added to 20 centimeter cubed of sodium hydroxide solution and excess. What that means is, Oh, can you say a 10 centimeter pipette? Yes, you can, Olivia. If you, if you said a 10 centimeter graduated pipette, I'd be much happier. The answer is yes, you can. Graduated pipettes come in all sizes. You can get five centimeter cubed, 10, 15, 20, 25. 25 is the most commonly used graduated pipette. Hence why I haven't actually named its volume. I just said, this piece of equipment I'm going to be using to take the accurate volume. So absolutely, of course you can, Olivia. You, sh you would have been given that mark. Cool. But by the way, I actually prefer your answer. Oh, almost. I should have put a 10 centimeter cubed graduated pet. That would be the perfect answer for that question. So do you know what? I'm adding it. It's nice that. A 10 centimeter cubed graduate of a pet. Thanks, Olivia. You're making my answers better. Thanks, you're a star. So at this point, measuring cylinder, totally fine. Measuring cylinder is, is your go-to piece of equipment for measuring any solution, unless they say the words take an accurate 10 centimeters or an accurate 20. As soon as that word accurate appears, measuring cylinder is out the window, and you're going to be looking for a graduate of a pet. I mean, you can use a five centimeter cubed one twice. Ugh, thanks, David. Do you know what? I don't think they'd penalize you. If you wrote a five, but just bear in mind, if you were to do that, David, you'd have to run the calculation. When you worked out errors, you'd have to run the, the, plot, the, the times two on the reading. Just, but... And why do we have to say graduated? Um, okay, uh, Rachel, good question. Because, let me show you. I can show you why. Because if you Google, oh, this is cool. I haven't done this on a webinar before. If you Google pipette, look at the image you get, Rachel, which is, and right, that's, that's, that's a lovely, that's a really lovely Google search because it explains why they allow it. Because the picture, um, this, so I'm gonna, just gonna wait for it to appear on your screens. So the pipette, the first picture, the plastic pipette, you would never, ever, ever use for taking out volumes of solution. Putting in the grinder. <laughs> Beast, because the pipette went through four years of high school. Not Olivia, it wasn't a high school, it was university. Oh, get it right, jeez. I'm just gonna put the lights on, by the way. It's a bit dark in here for me. Hang on. I'm back, okay. So when I do my Google search, you see that the pipette on the, far, the first one here, this one here, that is a pipette, a genuine pipette. Now, can I just point out that that should never be used for taking an accurate volume because it's complete garbage. This is for adding indicators, uh, Oh my God, Mr. Duncan's YouTube search history exposed. I got, I, I don't know what that means. Oh, why? What was my search history? What was it? Was it bad? I don't think it was. I got hurt. What did I have to Google? I don't know. Anyway, so, anyway, so the pipette there, not a suitable piece of equipment. But if you go back to the search, what you realize is not only amongst those dropping pipettes, there are also graduated pipettes as well, which is why they allow it. I don't like, I don't like the answer. I hate that the mark scheme allows it. That's why I'm like, please don't use it. 
If they say to take to take an accurate amount, you're going to say a graduated repair. If they say if you want to make an uh, take a, a quantity of a solution and they don't have any mention of accuracy, they, then a measuring cylinder is going to be a good choice. So anyway, just it's nice to go through it. What was I want to know? What my what was my I don't know what my, my Google search history was. What's my Google search history? It wasn't, I don't know what it was. I want to go back now and find out. Graduate with that. There's nothing interesting there. Why is that? Oh, I've ruined it now. James Franco exam was that are you just Odin stuff? Oh, there, there's there's nothing exciting there, guys. James Franco movies. Yeah, that, that's a that's a great shout. Anyway, back to my webinar. Okay, back to the paper. So next, suggest why each sample. I love this. This is one of my favorite questions. David. Writing in Korean is that that is that's I was expecting more Dragon Ball. Winky, it is lovely to have you join me. Really nice. Thanks for coming and listening to my year 13 webinar. I love that. Uh, and you know what? I'm surprised that there wasn't more Dragon Ball Z myself. Uh, I actually downloaded Broly recently. Great film. Although I haven't watched it yet. Suggest why the sample was added to sodium hydroxide solution. Explain your answer. This was really nice. This is one of my favorite questions on the paper. I had to go back to the equation. And that's the thing, is you're ever not sure, if you're ever not sure what the question is, always go back to the equation. <laughs> because in the equation, I spotted H plus. What that means is, if you add a base to this, that we know, year 13, you know that if an equation and it's balanced, it's a half equation and it's got H plus in it, it must be in acidic. Oh, it does not look like acidic. Uh, acidic conditions. That's what it means. Because if you take away the acidic conditions, the reaction will not proceed. So they've added a base. That was my favorite question. And I just realized that the sodium hydrogen carbonate is a base. It'll remove H plus ions and stop the reaction. It kills it. Which means when they take a sample. They can prevent that sample from continuing to go through the reaction simply by adding an excess of sodium hydrogen carbonate. What a lovely little... That's great chemistry right there, there you guys. Next. What color change would be observed, uh, um, would be expected to see if the reaction to take place? Right. So again, I went back up to the equation. This was already going, oh, I, I've already seen this. I've got brown, and it's going to go colorless. Now, of course... I wasn't entirely sure. I put yellow. Now, of course, the reason why I put yellow is because, well, unless you've got iodine in really, really, really strong settings, like high concentrations, you see brown. But in general, when you do this, and this is really, I feel like this one is 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 is, is experienced. And I felt like this question was a bit mean on 13s because I only know that yellow is what I would quote for iodine purely because I do my, 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 my group seven displacements at GCSE so often. And you never get to really see iodine as yellow. You, well, to be fair, it's usually darker anyway. Uh, my B wasn't marked. I put, I put brown to colorless. Yeah, and do you know what? I totally get it. Do you know what? Do you want me just a quick, um, can I see the mark scheme on this? Let's have a quick, Olivia, I completely agree with you. Do I have the mark scheme, paper six mark scheme? Let me check. Because you're right. Um, do both brown and yellow get a mark? Do you know what? Let's check. So I've got a feeling the answer will be yes. There you go. The answer is absolutely. So yellow, orange, but notice that yellow's first. That's just, that's totally from the fact that I do this so often and yellow is such a common answer for iodine. But of course, brown, I would, I, would have, I would have been very disappointed if Edexcel hadn't allowed it. So yes, you can do brown to colorless. If it hasn't been marked, add those marks. Do you need to, to specify starch solution or just starch? Do you know what, wink it. That's a really good question. The answer is you have to specify it. You should specify a starch solution. The mark scheme allows you to simply say starch, which is annoying as a chemist because starch isn't especially soluble. And if you've ever had to make a starch solution, which I have, it's an absolute nightmare. You add the white solid to the water, it doesn't dissolve. You have to heat it 
it until it's boiling, and then you have to let it cool down slowly because if you let it cool down too quick, it crystallizes out. Starch solution is a nightmare to make, but they do simply allow you to say starch. So yellow to colorless, brown to colorless, giving me good answers, I'm happy. So, wink it, I agree. Indicator, starch, solution. Do you know what, actually? The funny thing is, is the question itself points me in the just in the direction of a uh, of David adding vodka ain't going to work as an indicator. Come on, dude. Come on. Um, indicator star solution. It's I actually genuinely think that's a better answer. Uh, but they don't care that you're just saying starch because the starch is the bit that's forming the iodine complex, um, and hence the color change going from blue black to colorless. So that question, Olivia, David, anyone else? Rachel, you guys remember I did this with you guys in Miss Burton Morgan's lab. And I showed you how difficult and tricky this titration is. You have to add the starch just before the end point because otherwise you get flocking. So it said, at what stage in the titration is the indicator added? just before the end point that is the mark straight off the mark scheme i loved it when i read the mark scheme and I went nailed it and then i followed it with to prevent flocking of iodine starch complex i mean that's that just because i'm awesome really so um <laughs> so anyway to prevent the flocking and by the way flocking is a good but just to point out year 13 flocking is not a mark yeah flocking is the term given to it it's when a it's when small particulates group into larger clumps. And it does happen if you add the starch too early. But what they need there, the mark is for saying you add it just before the end point. Please note, they did not ask, why do you need to add it just before the end point? Why can't you add it earlier? Uh, if they did, you'd be totally allowed to say the word flocking. It's because you'd form the, the, the blue-black precipitate, which will then clump and flock together to form large clumps, which then don't re-dissolve. Anyway, going that little extra mile. Okay, so next. Next question I thought was, do you know what? This question for me was one, this, this one was one of the trickiest for me. Because when I did your paper, when I got this question, I was like, explain why these results can be determined the order of the reaction directly without calculating the corresponding concentration for iodine. I was like, what? Well, well, hang on a minute. If they want... The order with respect to iodine you need the concentration of iodine well if they're telling me i don't have to then they must be saying that i can use these numbers that the thiosulfate must be directly linked directly proportional to the iodine concentration and i wrote that answer down and i'm not gonna lie year 13 i was like I had no idea if that was correct, and it was wonderful for me to get that boost of confidence when I was like, saw that mark scheme at the end of the paper and was like, absolutely nailed it. I gave it nice. The volume of thiosulfate is proportional to the iodine concentration. It was, it was nice, that, because I really felt like when I saw that question, I felt like I was back in my year 13 days, and I was like, oh, I'm going to take a stab in the dark. It was nice to get that reward of... That's the right answer. So it's good that. I thought it was a tough one that. Next, plot the graph. Uh, okay, so number one, year 13, sub subtle flex. I, I, I don't know what that means. Uh, I'm too old for those kind of internet jargon that you use, Olivia. Come on. Um, this graph was appalling at year 13. Weren't you a delinquent in your year 13 days? David, of course not. No, I was I was the epitome of an amazing. I did all my homework. I was never late. I was like the perfect student. I have no idea what any of you are saying or where you'd even get such ridiculous ideas. Let's move on. <clears throat> let's let's move on. Um, guys, can I just point out you can't plot graphs. Like seriously, you you need to work on this, guys. Seriously. Like, some, some people just decided, which I thought was hilarious, to just start plotting, like, Steve against Sarah. It was, it, it's a good way of doing it. You didn't need it. It gave it in your actual question. Um, but 
You just had to go. Time goes up 1 to 19. Let's go to 20. Realize that 20 didn't fit very well, although you could have made it fit with fours, that that would have been then messy for plotting. So you went to 25. The other one went from from 1 to 19. It This was, this was a no-brainer. You just went to 25 on both axes. And then you plotted it. No physics gang. Well, I, I don't know what that... Olivia, why... Uh, I'll just move on. Anyway, plot a graph. Label your axes. Use a ruler. Keep it simple. Guys, uh, if you want help plotting graphs, I'm happy to put you you in touch with some year seven and eight teachers who will help teach you how to plot a graph in year 13 you should be able to do this by now guys come on come on anyway plot your graph draw your line you're done next this 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 was the only question i got right on the paper what in terms of what you actually did the graph correct david because that's brilliant i love that do you know what this question Although the last one, this that one was my favorite because it was one that uh, this was the only question I got right on the paper. Olivia just put F. I like it. Um, that was my favorite question on the paper. The volume of thiosulfate being proportional to the iodine concentration. I just thought it was genius. This question, though, I thought was one of the hardest. And the reason being is when it asked me, I knew, I knew, and and this is a trap, and it was written as a trap, and I saw it as soon as it came up. I was like, I know what they're doing. What they wanted me to think was happening was that I had plotted concentration against initial rate. That's what they wanted, and the usual graph being first. And I was like, this is a trap. Number one, the graph is doing this not that which meant this is not the graph i was ex uh, uh, that's this is not what i'm usually seeing and i was like right do you know what i need to think about this and what i then had to kind of i had to think about this and it says what's the order with respect to iodine and i realized that well i've plotted the amount of fire sulfate needed and the time so it's so what it then so if you just actually just say this out loud at one minute i needed 19.1 at four minutes i need 15.9 at seven i needed 13 when i started saying this to myself i was like okay so as time goes on the iodine is decreasing that makes sense okay i get that so what that means is if the iodine is decreasing the concentration is decreasing now, if the concentration was decreasing and it had an impact, the rate wouldn't be consistent. It, it, it would decrease exponentially, but it doesn't. It just decreased in a linear fashion. What this means is that the iodine concentration is not affecting the rate in terms of order. It's just saying that as the concentration drops, the rate is dropping. Or the reaction, sorry, I tell a lie. The rate isn't changing. The concentration is dropping and it's dropping in a uniform manner. The rate is staying the same. So the iodine must therefore be zero order. That's genius in my opinion. That's the hardest question on the paper because the leap you have to make in an exam, and, and do you know what, year 13, so the rate it so the rate is the gradient right yes and what's the gradient consistent what that means is the gradient isn't changing throughout any of the practical so what's the rate doing staying the same but the iodine is still decreasing which means it can't be having any impact it must be zero order david does that make sense because that was one of the hardest questions on this paper. And when I filled, I'm not going to lie, when I wrote that answer, I starred it. And I was like, I, that's the first question I checked because that was hard. And the only reason why I didn't jump to first was simply because I knew it was a trap. And I was like, 
wait, hang on a minute. I need to take my time on this. There's, there's something going on here, especially since it's two marks. I hope that all makes sense. The gradient is the rate, the rate. Therefore, because the slope is constant all the way down, gradient doesn't change. The rate, did, the rate didn't change. Therefore, the iodine, which is decreasing, is not changing it. So it had to be zero. Such a genius question. I loved it. I wrote what he wrote, then I added constant half-life. Ah, yeah, I get that. You, uh, you're pretty much just throwing in random remarks there out of chemistry kinetics. I quite like it. Explain why. Right. This was the kicker. Oh, I forgot about this. The following rate determining step of the reaction between propano and iodine is suggested. Explain why your order of reaction with respect to iodine is consistent with the rate determining step. Guys, this was the nail in the coffin. I loved this because at this point, I was like, I'm so, I've so got the right answer for the last one. I'm so correct. I've nailed this question because iodine isn't there. This is the rate determining step. The two things here are there. They affect the rate, and iodine isn't there. Iodine must be zero order, otherwise it would be in that equation. Iodine does not appear in RDS, so it must be zero order. I loved it. That, for me, was like, oh, they gave me a horrible question, and then followed it up with, oh, just so, just so you know, here's the right answer if you need it and you got it wrong in the first place. Because if you put first, you come down to this and go, what? Uh, it's first order. Where's the, where, that, that would be, that there would be first order. What would second order be? Second order would be that. It, it was, it just because it wasn't there, I was like, oh, it's so nice to have them just go, that's your answer and your previous one is correct. I felt so much better when I saw that. Right, next one into your transition metals. Oh my God, the mess you guys, you guys drew for these questions was hilarious. I mean, honestly, God. So you need to draw a titration that is being kept at a constant temperature. So you draw a burette, you put a conical flask at the bottom, you put it in a water bath, and you add a thermometer to the water bath. Just so you know, you could have put the thermometer inside the conical flask or the water bath. Yeah, you could have done that. You could also have even added a little thermostat on the side if you could have done a little box here like that and gone thermostat put a little dial on there that, that would have been hilarious thermostat yeah but you could have done what they wanted is you could have also added in a hot plate here yeah add a hot plate hot plate yeah you could have done anything as long as would would you have drawn the source of heat oh i drew mine in 3d oh david david no, there are no 3D diagrams in chemistry. None. I except when you draw ionic solids in the funny one for AS unit two. Oh. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Sick lights. My internet, my thing has suddenly decided it doesn't want to share the screen anymore. Let's try that again. That's weird. Yes, I know. Thanks, David. That that was that was not. I'm not entirely sure why it does. Oh, share your entire screen. Yes, I, I did this before. Why did you just decide you? I, I have it flat so I can write on it, David. Okay, is that tri trigon or planar? Hang on a sec. I I've lost track. Of I drew mine in 3D. David, you don't draw anything in 3D. Next, um, Olivia Picasso is alive. Oh, oh dear. Would you have drawn the heat source? No, wink it. You, you, you. Once, once you kind of leave key stage three, you never draw a Bunsen burner. You just draw an arrow with the word heat underneath it. It's a great question, and and it's nice for you to add that to your to your knowledge for when you go to year thirteen. You just draw an arrow with the word heat underneath it. It's a water bath, dude. A that sunset. Yeah, sick lights, nice lights. Is that trigonal planar? Oh, guys. I'll, 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 uh, yeah, anyway, let's continue the webinar. <laughs> oh, my goodness. My other half is laughing at you guys. I'll give you a virtual tour of the apartment at the end if you fancy it. Um, anyway, what is removed by filtering through glass wool? Right, why, right, 
The first question is, why would you filter through glass wool? And the answer is, you can't filter hot acids or alkalis through paper. You'll dissolve it, it'll muck up, it'll turn brown, nasty mess. So this must be acidic or alkali and probably hot. So the glass wool, of course, is completely unreactive. What was... Um, <laughs> what was... Yeah, also... Oh, yeah, anyway, thanks. So, anyway, you're removing the excess... Uh, the zinc metal that was added as the reducing agent. Remember year 13s, that transition metals, if we want to reduce them, we use zinc and HCl. If you want to oxidize them, you use hydrogen peroxide in alkali. So we've got zinc and HCl in, and the zinc will always be in excess because the zinc's going to reduce it and reduce it and reduce it until it stops. It's going to take it down to its lowest oxidation state. And then we need to remove that excess metal because if we don't, as soon as you start doing anything with that, it'll just keep bringing you down. So we've got to remove it first. Suggest why the mixture is filtered directly into the potassium permanganate. Um, right. The reason, guys, if you if you uh, filter that solution into a beaker and leave it standing, when you've got any transition metal which can go through multiple oxidation states and give you multiple colors, vanadium being an absolutely prime example because we know that vanadium has five, four, three, and two, and we go from a yellow, green, blue, green, violet as you go down. If you, if you leave it exposed to air, it'll just start moving up. They don't want to be in the low ones. They want to be in the, the medio, the middling ones. So we're, it's to prevent oxidation on standing with air. We want to go straight into, straight into the, uh, Straight into the beaker, straight into the process of actually doing our tests. Next. Explain why an indicator is not required. Because the potassium permanganate is going to go through a color change anyway. It's going to act as a natural indicator. If you add another indicator in here, you're only going to confuse the matter. You're only going to confuse it. So I put manganate will go through a color change with an indicator access. That, that was me not writing correct English. Manganate will go through a color change, which, I'm an idiot, I'm very sorry, which acts, which acts as an indicator. As, oh, as an, I've made a mess of that. Which acts as a natural indicator. You get the point. What if I wrote there is already a clear color change? Oh, David, that is the best question you've asked in ages. The, the, the previous comment, not so great. Um, but, right, okay, there is a clear color change anyway. You haven't stated what's causing it. You're just simply saying there's already going to be a color change. Well, yeah, but you needed to say that the permanganate, this is a one mark question which what they want you is not just to say that there's going to be a color change. You need to be stating where the color change is coming from. The reason why you don't need to add the indicator is because this is potassium permanganate, which is a transition metal, which will go through natural color changes anyway. Sorry, David. I know, sad face. I know. Next, calculate the number of moles of vanadate ions in 25 centimeters C times V over 1,000. Look how, look, talk about, guys, just GCSE right there. That was like, Winner, smiley face. Next, calculate the total volume of uh, potassium permanganate, hence the total moles. So, right, I just had to read the question again. At that point, I was like, what? What do you mean the total? Why do I have a total? And then I realized that there was 50 directly into the beaker, and then they had already, solution T was formed when 25, there was already 25, and the mixture filtered directly into, they'd add in a second one, guys. So the total amount, is that right? If I just, no, no, just ruined it. Just got it wrong. The mixture was filtered directly into 50 centimeters. The end point, right, so they filtered the mixture into 50. The end point occurred a further 25. So the answer was a total of 75 was needed. So one mark for 75. Then run your concentration, C times V over 1,000, and you got your, your moles. Not too difficult. Just required you to do a bit of hunting back in the question. 
Remember, folks, the, the answers are usually in the question if you don't know them. You know this. Always remember to look back in the question. Next. Right. Complete the half equation for the reduction of manganate ions. MnO4 minus blank H plus blank H. Yeah, you guys know that equation. Half of you should have been able to do without even, like, even actually having to work it out. I know that, I mean, I, I know I've been doing this a long time, but, like, you get used to these. Four waters, AH plus is five electrons. Five electrons being the important thing. Next. Right. Oh, okay. Okay, guys. I'm going to slow down now because, in my opinion, this question was probably the most horrible on the paper. Now, it did make me feel better because I had done this with you, year 13. I had done one of these equations, one of these questions in class. One of these, oh, Steve has got an unknown transition metal. He's going to put it through a reaction with this. What was its original oxidation state? These questions are lovely, and they like to do them. I haven't seen one in a while. It was nice for it to appear on the paper. So, first thing, we already had worked out our moles of potassium permanganate. So I wrote them down again. I just wanted to make this absolutely clear. I didn't want to have to hunt all the time. Next, the moles of vanadium. Right, hang on a sec. Have we done that? Yes, we had. The ammonia, the moles of vanadium were there as well. At this point, I was like, well, hang on a sec. I'm adding that much permanganate, this much permanganate, to this much vanadium. What's the ratio? Because I know in chemistry, this is why, God, guys, the level of difficulty, this is A2. This is what you need to be able to realize, that moles tells you ratios, which meant... What was the lowest lowest value that I could divide them all by, which is 0.0005? And I got a ratio of 5 to 3, or 3 to 5 in this case. What that now meant I could do was I could write out my manganate equation going to MN2+. You guys know this. I've shown it to you. It's what it does. MnO4, MnO4- minus will become MN2+. Plus. And then what I needed to realize was there needed to be a 3 in front of him. So this entire equation was going to need to be multiplied by 3. So I did. I then wrote down the vanadium equation. Now, I knew the vanadium was going to end at 5. The question told me so. The question said a mixture of vanadium in purple, and it was vanadi vanadate 5. So it was in a plus 5. And they added the zinc. So the zinc's going to bring it down. And note the color. In the experiment to determine the oxidation number of vanadium in a purple solution, T. Solution T was formed when sodium vanadate 5. So purple was plus 5. Look what happened. Was reduction was complete, the yellow valet had turned purple. So they were taking it all the way down, all the way up. And so what I did was I then realized, so that's going down to that. The, van the vanadium, which was the question mark. And how far down did I take it? I'm going to take it back up. Potassium permanganate is an oxidizing agent. It's going to raise it. It's always going to bring it up. And if you leave it long enough, it's going to raise it to five. Vanadium stops at five. You know this. So it takes it up to five. Now, what that meant is, because my ratio, I needed a five in front of the vanadiums. So I put a five. I had three permanganates from the ratio, five vanadiums in front of the vanadiums. But now here's the leap of faith. The electrons must add up. If that was the reaction, it is saying, in a 3 to 5 ratio, all the electrons vanished. Guys, there is never spare electrons. So, when I balanced this one, it required 15. And I put the 15 over there. Which means, 
that I had a vanadium in a plus something going to plus 5 and 15 electrons. I balanced the two sides. I had 5 vanadium. I've suddenly realized I've scribbled all over this and made it almost impossible. I had 5 vanadium 5 pluses. That's 25 plus and 15 minuses. That gave me plus 10. I must have had plus 10, conservation of electric charge. God, guys, this is the hardest question on the paper. Conservation of electric charge, 10 plus must have, which means the five vanadiums, the five vanadiums must have added up to plus 10, which means it must have been plus two. It was a hard question year 13. And I, I mean, God, people hope that they don't turn up, but really tough, really, really tough. Don't kick yourself if you didn't get it. I'll give you some more of those. I've got a bank of those questions. I'm trying to, sorry, I've got a fly phone. Um, I've got um, a bank of those questions, which I can run through with you guys. Next, in acidic solution, vanadate, vanadate VO3 minus. I'll change to VO2 plus. Like this was this was genius because when I did it, I thought there were going to be electrons, but there aren't because VO3 minus VO2 plus. Right, first of all, vanadiums add up. Add your water because you've got an extra oxygen. Add your water. Only needed one though. Therefore, you now need two H pluses to give me the hydrogens. Now check your charge. Water is neutral. Vanadate is plus one. Plus one on that side. P minus one there. Plus two there. Overall, plus one. Guys, no electrons needed. Genius. Loved it. So do we put 15 electrons in the vanadium equation because it has to be the same as the manganate one? Yes! David, yes! There are no... No such things as unused electrons. They must balance. So I worked out the, the ratio of the two from the moles. Then I balanced them with that ratio. And then I just made sure that the electrons were the same for both of them. That's what you do. That's it, David. Next. Right. Some standard electrode potentials of tin and vanadium are given below. Ah, oh, year 13. You must have been looking at these questions going, Mr. Duncan did all of these with us. I didn't do this one, but it's just another one, which is great. Some standard electrode potentials of tin and vanadium are given below. It says, use these values to predict the lowest oxidation number of vanadium that can be produced from VO2 plus using tin as a reducing agent. Right. Well, hang on a minute. Where's VO2 plus? Let's find it. Oh, sorry. There we go. Right. VO2 plus. It's plus one. Find tin. Right. Right, we want the tin on this side, which means flip the more negative. That's more negative than that. Tin will reduce it for that guy. Yes, that'll drive that to there. Next. Right, I now have this guy, which is over here. So, will tin drive the next one? So this is plus 0.34. This is more negative. It will go that way. It will drive to there, to V3+. plus. Right, next, the V3+, plus reappears over here. Now, can the tin drive V3+, plus to V2+, plus? and the answer is no. So it can't go any further because you flip the more negative. What that means is the vanadium 2 plus would be on the, the tin's going to be on the wrong side of the reaction. It's not a powerful enough uh, reducing agent. The tin won't do it. And that's your answer. It's not a powerful enough reducing agent. And quote your data. So the lowest oxidation state of vanadium is plus 3. The E standard values vanadium 3 plus is 0.26. More negative than tin, so tin cannot reduce any further. Relatively straightforward. Two marks. Just got to bounce it. Next. Oh, God. Equilibrium. Oh, the mess that it now entails. Okay. My computer's having a hissy fit. Right. 
He's on a thanoate. Uh, it's hydrolyzed in the presence of an acid, dilyhydrochloric acid, according to the following equation. In an experiment, right? Yada, 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 yada. Waffle, waffle, waffle. Straight question. Show that 25 centimeters cubed of the equilibrium contains 0 0.0960 moles of ethanoic acid. <coughs> okay. Guys, I'm not going to lie. I had to take two runs at this. <laughs> this question is actually really generous. I can tell you why. Because it told you what you needed to find. It said in the question, I'm sorry, my laptop's having a little bit of a fit. It said, prove this. And guys, the first time I did it, I didn't get that. So it's really nice for me. I'm, I'm, I'm always honest with you, year 13. I would never, ever pretend like I am, like I am not, that I am infallible. In fact, it is way more important for me to show you guys that this question is hard. And even someone who has been teaching A-level chemistry for 10 years is going to struggle with these kind of questions. What that means is they need practice. You can't go into these without doing so. You'll just, you'll just get lost. And I need you guys to be well-versed. So... Okay, so first thing I did, now it's interesting, I should have shown you my correction, would have been more useful. Right, so the first thing I realized was that there's an acid catalyst here, and they're asking me to detect an acid. What that means is, if I've got an acid catalyst in here, when I do a titration with sodium hydroxide, I'm going to pick up both. So I need to be aware of that. So I've got to calculate that first. So I looked at the question, and I highlighted, I said, all right, 10 centimeters cubed of dilute hydrochloric acid at that concentration. Right, first, first step, work out your moles. That's what I did. First, moles of HCl, one times 0 0.01 moles. Now, here was the clever bit. I then needed to remember that at the latter stage, they took out several five centimeter samples from the 25. Now, what that means is, guys, what I hated this because, guys, that is just mean because several several no they took five and they didn't tell you that because they didn't want to they're deliberately going you figure out that it's five you can't take several if several means seven you can't do it they've taken five which is mean so i then had to realize that the amount of acid in my sample must be one fifth of that so i divided it by five to get me my moles of hcl per titration Next, the sodium hydroxide from the titration. The mean titer, there it is. The concentration, there it is. Oh, bro, I haven't even been alive for 10 years. Olivia, either you've been bumped up a lot of years or that statement's just, just downright incorrect. And yes, I'm old and I've been teaching a long time. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. <laughs> Um, so dividing about okay, so then I worked out my titration. Now my titration was four or five. So I then needed to realize that I needed to remove that was the sodium hydroxide. The sodium hydroxide has neutralized two things. That NaOH has neutralized the ethanoic acid and the HCl from one of the fives. So I took away one of the fives. And I got the moles of NaOH needed to neutralize the acid. And then, once that, that is the moles, because this is the leap, the ethanoic acid reacts in a one-to-one -one reaction to form sodium ethanoate and water. It's a one-to-one-to-one-to-one, -to -one -to -one, which means every mole of that is the same as the moles of that. So there are the moles of NaOH. That's the moles of ethanoic acid in five times by five and you got the number they wanted hard question guys all about pulling out the numbers but look at how i organized it moles of hcl moles of neoh 
Ha take that away. That's in five. Guys, one of the worst things is when you don't label what your calculations are saying. Look at what I've done. Sodium hydroxide used for five centimeter sample. I'm being clear. Yeah. So if you do that, it'll make everything a lot easier. I promise. Next. Deduce the number of moles of each of the other components in the equilibrium mix. Right. Usual thing. It's nice to do the little maths bit as well, the geeky maths bit at the end. So I've got, I wrote down the equation again. I mean, talk about being thorough, Mr. Duncan. What can I say? You know, I'm just super, super thorough. Wrote down the equation again. Wrote down what the initial were from the question, realizing that the rest of them are going to be zero. Then I said, right, hang on a minute. I've just worked out. In fact, I didn't even have to work out. They told me. The, so the, the equilibrium mixture contains 0.096 of ethanoic acid, which means they must have contained the same amount of ethanol, and these guys are going to drop by the same number, which I showed in this little equation at the bottom. So, and then it just spat out your numbers, nice and easy. Next, how are we doing? We're doing well. Next, give the KC expression. That, guys... You must have all thought that was a gift after the level of difficulty. This paper's hard. Like, they've literally walked you through an iodine clock, through to a transition metal unknown oxidation state change, through to an equilibrium titration. Ech! This is vile. Um, do you know what? I'm so glad that, that I didn't make it. Yeah, I kind of did. I'm sorry, guys. I made this paper. I made it really hard. I'm really sorry. Um, so anyway, that was it. That, that was a nice, easy, easy question. That made things easier. Next, uh, my computer is really struggling. Sorry, guys. It's it's because I'm moving between. There we go. I'm nearly there. There we go. So nice KC expression. Into put in your data. You just plug in your numbers. Notice how I've handled it. I plugged in my numbers, and then using the calculator, I plugged the. I did the top and bottom separately. Then ran it through, and I got my KC values, nice and easy. Next, explain why does it why it's possible in this case to calculate KC in, in, uh, using moles instead of concentrations. So immediately, this question I recognised, and I said, "Ah, uh, well, this is easy. There's two molecules on either side. What that means is the volume is going to cancel. So you can use straight moles instead of concentration, which is nice." And I'm not going to lie, that's, it's kind of uncommon in a, in a unit six paper. They tend to give you ones that require the conversion. So just be aware of it. Last one, and this is the last question, and we're done. Look at that. Amazing. Ha, right, okay, actually, this is quite hard. The experiment was re repeated by the student, whose value for KC differed from the value from the calculated in A4. A4. The student made several, several oh, suggestions to explain this. State and explain how, if at all, each suggestion would affect case C ob obtained by the student compared with that of A4. Suggestion one. Right, guys, I hope you all realize that they've, we've cut this. The question, there was going to be a second suggestion, and we haven't done it. So nice to see that. This is what they, they, the example do this as well. So suggestion, the concentration of the sodium hydroxide solution used was less, less, less than 0 0.05. Right, hang on a minute. So hang on, I've got to go right back because she's just thrown in a random comment regarding sodium hydroxide. Hang on a sec, sorry. My laptop is having a mare, wait. Oh, don't change. There we go. Right. Got to go back up because what I need to do is I need to figure out where the sodium hydroxide comes into play. Look at it having to, it's really struggling. It's having to add all this additional lighting to the, to the, to the thing. Right. And here it is. The moles of sodium hydroxide are here. And if the concentration was less, then what that means is I would have detected less, oh, 
hang on. This is why this is hard. If the concentration in the burette is lower, what's that going to do to the amount of sodium hydroxide that I add before endpoint? It's going to be larger. Just think about it. If I add one molar, I need 25. If someone gave me 0 0.8 instead, I've got to add more. That's, that's the leap. Everyone gets this backwards. If the concentration is lower, I have to add more. But no one knew it was lower. What that means is they think there was more acid. So hang on a minute. More acid. They think that the acid was larger. Now, if the acid is larger, then the bottom number is smaller. Which means my KC will increase. KC would be larger. Bigger, tighter would be the result. Bigger, tighter means you think there was more ethanoic acid in the equilibrium. E ethanoic acid is a product. Bigger top number when calculating KC. Smaller bottom number. KC would be larger. That was a tough question. It was a hard paper year 13. And I want you to know that I know it was tough and I want you to be resilient for this. We now need, guys, it's the end game now, folks. We now need to push for the end. I'll see you guys when you get back from Chinese New Year. It's been lovely to hang out. I will see you guys when we get back to school, and I'll give you as much time as I possibly can. You know that always. I wish you all the best, guys. Have a great Chinese rest of Chinese New Year, and I'll see you on Monday. Take care, guys. Oh, do you know what I'm going to do? Just before I do that, I'll drop on back on. I'll stop my sharing. Oh, now I suddenly realize that you guys are going to be like, oh, well, there's not really much to show, folks, to be fair. Got Donna over there. She's giving you a wave. There she is. Yeah, she's on the couch. We're having a nice, relaxing Chinese New Year. Signing out. But, guys, it's been lovely to hang out. I hope it's been useful. If you've got any questions, come and see me, always. I wish you all the best. See you on Monday. Bye, guys.